a trifle deaf in this ear. Speak a little louder next time. I have a question. Are you doing anything on Saturday night? <laughs> well, hopefully you'll be watching the biggest game of the week and one of the biggest of the year in college football. The Sooners and the Buckeyes from the Horseshoe. And the Associated Press says that these are the top two programs of all time. And ESPN says ditto. As a matter of fact, ESPN's College Game Day, which just seems to grow more and more popularity, will be in Columbus, Ohio for the Saturday showdown. Sooners come in as an underdog. We'll talk more about that in a second. Of course, the game can be seen on ABC. And hopefully you'll be watching the game. If you can't watch it, hopefully you'll listen to it on the radio or check it out on your streaming service. Before we break this matchup down any further, let's go ahead and give you an injury update. Of course, uh, news not good at all for Jordan Parker. Um, last year started several games at corner. Got beat out this year by Parnell Motley. Uh, but, you know, Parker was used on special teams on Saturday, but he didn't get to play very long. That's because on a punt return, injured his knee, he's done for the year. Remember, this was already a precarious position for the Sooners. You know, even though Motley's done a heck of a job, if anything happens to him, boy, now you really have a big problem as far as corner. Because remember, there's no Parrish Cobb anymore. He got kicked off the team this past year. And now you don't have Jordan Parker, who, like I said, played a lot at corner last year and started several games. So bad, bad break for Jordan Parker because it's not the first time he has faced a significant injury. As far as Ohio State, um, we didn't see Mike Weber last week. That's because of previous hamstring issues. But uh, J.K. Dobbins did pretty well in that win over uh, Indiana. Urban Meyer, by the way, just recently said that both Dobbins and Weber would start. They must co-starters. And how do I feel about that? In my opinion, it's just my opinion only. I still think Dobbins is going to get the majority of touches in this game, if not most. And I say that because it's a long season, okay? And unless that hamstring is just completely healed, I don't see Weber playing much in this game at all. I mean, that hamstring is going to have to be fully ready to go because, again, this is only September, and you got a lot of games left to go in the case of Ohio State. You know, they still have matchups uh, down the road. Of course, you know, they get to play, you know, the likes of Penn State and, you know, Nebraska, Michigan. Um, so, you know, they got to have as much depth as possible, which has never been a problem for Ohio State, but reliable depth and Weber definitely gives them that. So I would be surprised, again, if the both backs got equal amount of touches. I still think Dobbins, who I was impressed with his footwork in that win last week over the Hoosiers, I think that he will still be the primary back. But Urban Meyer um, has both Weber and Dobbins as co-starters. So that clears up that situation. On my weekly matchup shows, if you've never watched them before, first of all, thanks for joining us if you haven't. And, of course, thanks for joining us if you've always um, been a part of them. I always try to look at these matchups from the perspective of the underdog. In other words, what can the underdog do against Oklahoma in order to win? I try to keep an open mind. It just makes the show flow a little bit better. Now, in this case, though, a rarity. Oklahoma's not favored, okay? Rarely on my shows, since I've done them since uh, 2009, has Oklahoma not been the favorite. In this case, the line has gone from 5.5 in favor of Ohio State up to 7.5 for the Buckeyes. So this case, kind of a rarity. I'm going to look at this from the Oklahoma perspective and say, okay, what can the Sooners do to win a game like this? I think the first thing they got to do is get to JT Barrett, the quarterback. Here's why. Last season, Ohio State gave up 28 sacks. 22 of those sacks occurred in Ohio State's five toughest games. Okay, um, That's about 80% of their sacks that they allowed happened against Michigan, Michigan State, and Wisconsin. All three of those games, the way it played out, could have gone either way. The other two games, they lost. Penn State, which I believe they gave up six sacks, and also they lost to Clemson in the playoff. So that's something to think about. The other six sacks occurred in the other eight ball games, which weren't as competitive, and that included the Sooner game. So that's just barely over 20% of their sacks given up against the other eight opponents, which were, of course, all Ohio State's wins. And again, not as competitive at those five games in which they gave up nearly 80% of their sack total. You can't let JT Barrett be comfortable, eat a hot dog, and pick whoever he wants to throw to, especially the dangerous Paris Campbell, as we found out a week ago. Okay? So, I don't care what OU has to do. Yes, you might have to roll the dice, okay? You're going to have to send outside blitzes. You're going to have to get Emmanuel Beal involved. Of course, Caleb Kelly, same thing. Of course, Kelly keeps getting better and better. 
Um, and I know that, you know, he's not really a blitzer, but Kenneth Murray is going to really have to hold his own at linebacker, just making his second career start, the freshman. So the bottom line is you can't just rely on the front four because you're going against Ohio State, that, a line that other than Pat Elfline returns everybody. So big challenge for the Sioux. you got to be able to at least hurry JT Barrett and get some sacks. You can do that. Unlike last year, you got a shot in this one. Number two, the Sooners need to rush for at least 130 yards. It's that plain and simple. At least 130. Now, you might have watched the Ohio State-Indiana game last week. If you didn't, yeah, Indiana was leading by one point at 21-20 to with about four minutes to go in the third quarter. Yeah, that was a stunner. And then, of course, Ohio State woke up, and they pulled away, and that final score ended up being 49-21, to just to tell you how explosive Ohio State can be and how, at any second, they can turn their game around. Indiana threw for over 400 yards in the ball game, but only rushed for 17 yards. Only 17. That tells you how good the front four of Ohio State is. This is one of the premier matchups that we're going to see in college football for quite a while because Oklahoma has one of the best offensive lines in the country. Everybody back, and Ohio State has a fantastic defensive line, maybe the best in the country. A terrific front seven that returns everybody except for Raquan McMillan, the inside linebacker. So it's going to be strength against strength in this matchup because Baker Mayfield, I have no doubt he's going to get passing yardage. I have no question about that. But remember five years ago in that big matchup against Notre Dame, you might remember that matchup when Notre Dame came to Oklahoma undefeated and Manti Teo and his you know posse of defensive teammates, how good they were. They gave Landry Jones a lot of passing yards. In fact, Jones ended up with over 300 yards passing in that game. But OU averaged less than one yard per carry in that contest. You know how many yards per carry Indiana averaged last week against Ohio State? Less than one yard per carry. So Abdul Adams, we didn't see him much last week, but he did play um, in the first quarter. But that was really it. And I think Lincoln Riley served a great purpose for that. That's because... They're going to use him a lot this week, okay? Not that you won't see Sutton, not that you won't see Sermon, and of course you're going to see Rodney Anderson and Dimitri Flowers from time to time when they get in tight yardage situations or get close to the goal line. But Abdul Adams, he's improved since last season. I think he will be the primary ball carrier, but it's up to that offensive line to at least give Oklahoma the ability to run because if you don't, yeah, Baker Mayfield can throw for a lot of yardage, but without a running attack, yeah, this game will be all Buckeyes, okay? And th that's the thing. You know, I give the Hoosiers credit for the way they played last week and how terrific of a job that they did throwing the ball. Remember in that game, you know, at halftime, Indiana had almost 300 yards of passing. They did that good of a job. But they could never, ever get a running attack going. And as the game wore on in the second half, that eventually would play into the favor of the Buckeyes. you got to be able to show Ohio State you can run the ball. Otherwise... You know, the Buckeyes will make it a little bit more difficult for Oklahoma to move the ball overall once you get to the third and fourth quarter. So show the ability to run, and again, that's going to make things easier in this game. And then number three, we're talking about OU being productive when they get in Ohio State territory. Remember last year's game? Uh, you might remember that opening drive. It was brilliant. A work of art until that final series, first and goal, and they come away with nothing. They miss a short field goal. Third possession of the game, they're marching the ball. They're in Ohio State territory. Fourth down, I think, around the Ohio State 35-yard line, something like that. Baker Mayfield not only can't deliver on fourth down, but throws an interception that Ohio State runs back for a pick six. And then in the second quarter, OU's driving, first and goal. Baker Mayfield takes a sack. Eventually, the Sooners would have to settle for a field goal. So what I'm trying to tell you is that the Sooners last year, especially in that first half, moved the ball effectively against the Buckeyes. But it wasn't the most effective because they only came away with three points on three critical drives in that particular first half. You do that again against Ohio State, uh, yeah, you can forget it'll be game, set, match to the Buckeyes. So, got to be more productive when they drive, especially when they get inside Ohio State's 20-yard line. That's the big, big thing. Yeah, a field goal is nice. It's not as good as a touchdown. But the worst thing is to come away, obviously, with your pockets empty and not getting a point. Um, and, and like I said about Ohio State, Indiana, if you watched that game last week, you know that Indiana, and you commend them for, for how well they played, they just didn't have the juices to play with Ohio State for four quarters. The big thing about the Buckeyes, they still possess that big playability, even though I know Curtis Samuel's not there anymore, and even though I know Noah Brown's not there anymore, uh, those are two guys that shredded Oklahoma's lunch last season in Norman. 
but they still had the big playability with Barrett. And, of course, uh, J.K. Dobbins proved that he can play as well. And Paris Campbell, he's got that speed. So this will be a big, big, big thing for the Sooners to be able to contain Ohio State. They can do that. You know, this thing may come down in the fourth quarter. I do think the Sooners will play better. What we saw last week against UTEP, I know it was just UTEP, but you saw Baker Mayfield uh, be patient, and you saw him uh, with laser precision. A game like this against Ohio State, you know he's not going to have as much time. So the decision-making, we'll see if it's improved for Baker in this game as opposed to last year's game against Ohio State. Um, my final thoughts in the game like this, I do think the Sooners, because I'm not saying they have a blueprint on how to beat Ohio State, from a talent perspective, they know now what to expect from the Buckeyes. There's a little bit more familiarity, which will help. It's going to be them against the world in a game like this. So I do think from a motivation perspective, from what they learned last year, they are going to play better. And I do think Oklahoma will cover the 7.5, but barely. Ohio State's still the more talented team. They're playing at home. And Ohio State's only lost twice at home in the Urban Meyer era. To keep a score at home, that's six seasons that Urban Meyer has coached at Ohio State, entering year number seven. And, of course, speaking of Urban Meyer, that's another factor, too. For Lincoln Riley, who I think will be a fantastic uh, coach as far as his resume down the road as head coach of Oklahoma, this is just the second game he's ever coached in. And for Urban Meyer, he has coached in a lot of big games, and he wins the majority of them. So that's a factor as well. I've got Ohio State winning 31-24. to That's what my brain says. And you know what, Sooner fans? Take this as reverse psychology. I hope I'm wrong, okay? Because my heart will be pulling for Oklahoma like crazy. But if you're asking me to go with my brain, my brain says the Ohio State is still the better team. And, of course, playing in Columbus does not help Oklahoma's cause at all. I hope they prove me wrong. I will admit it so many times on my next show, which will be my post-game show Saturday night after the game, if I prove to be wrong. But if you're asking me to go with my brain, Ohio State at home, Urban Meyer, the talent that Ohio State possesses. Yeah, um, I think OU will fight like crazy and will put together a better effort than last year, but it won't be enough. I think Ohio State wins by seven. Again, I just kind of teased it. My post-game show will occur um, after the game on Saturday night. May I be wrong? Boomer Sooner.